All right, hello everyone. Welcome to the lecture for chapter three. This chapter is all about forecasting. The idea that if we're gonna be able to match uh, supply to demand, we have to have pretty good idea of what demand possibly would be. And so this chapter is all about the quantitative techniques we can do in order to improve our forecasting methods and choosing the most appropriate one. If you've taken quantitative methods, you'll know that there is a chapter on um, forecasting in that um, in that class as well. Um, we get into a lot more of the business case use of it in this class, um, but I think it's a good uh, you know it, it, it's a good complement to what we learn in this, what you might have learned in that. And if you haven't taken quant yet, um, you know looking back at the work you do in this chapter should certainly help you out in that class. So um, chapter three, you can see from the learning objectives here that um, that there's quite a few uh, learning objectives. Now we're not going to cover nearly all of these. Um, we're going to focus on the on the simpler types of forecasting. Um, for instance, learning objective three, twelve. Um, we're not going to be covering that as far as the work we're going to do. Um, and um, then we're also going to. Uh, look at ways of uh, monitoring errors when we're forecasting. Sometimes your forecast is off. You got to see how far off it was. If there was possibly a better technique that might work for your type of business, because not all forecasting techniques are going to be best for all types of business. So, what's a forecast? A statement about the about the future value of a variable of interest. That's that's the definition given. So, for example, uh, we might say it's going to be. 30 degrees tomorrow or 70 degrees tomorrow. We might say that um, we expect to sell this many vehicles on Tuesday. We might say that, um, you know, we are you know, projected to run out of this required resource by, you know, two weeks from now. So we need to get an order placed. And forecasts of any kind are going to be important. If you're going to make a decision, an informed decision and not just blind guess, you need to have some sort of quantity quantitative or qualitative reason to back that up if you're going to be making good decisions. So um, two important aspects here, you need you want to try to figure out the expected level of demand. And then we're also looking at accuracy afterwards. So uh, quality projection and then see how how um, how accurate we're on our projection compared to the uh, actual. So looking at it um, ahead of time to try to forecast our demand and then looking at it backwards to see was that the right um, technique that we used? What kind of forecast might be what might we use across various organizations? Um, you can look at finance. They might uh, estimate when equipment needs to be replaced, so they need to know when they need to come up with the money. Human resources might use forecasting to try to determine through advanced analytics when um, turnover might occur, or if uh, you know there might be a need for layoffs, or hiring more workers, or temporary seasonal workers. Marketing use forecast to determine business levels to to ensure that you know you're pricing correctly, you're running promotions correctly. And then the operations team, of course, uses it for so many different things, assigning work, um, determining how much capacity you're going to have at a new facility that you're building. Um, if there's a need to outsource projects to uh, uh, other countries or companies to do some of the work or to bring in temporary workers or to um, run a, a new project that needs to be managed or seeing if that project's on time. So lots of use for forecasts. And you're going to see that this term forecasting come up throughout the rest of the semester. There are some features that are common to all types of forecasts. Um, one is we have to make the assumption that there's some reason that existed in the past, and that same reason will hold true in, in the future. If we're looking at past data to predict future performance, then there's some causal reason there. So that's that's got to be true. Uh, two is that um, we're, we have to know that forecasts are not perfect. There's always going to be some sort of random variation that's going to occur. Um, some sort of error is going to occur, even if you account for everything. Okay. Um, forecasts for groups of items are more accurate than those for individual items. If I'm trying to tell you a forecast for total sales, that's going to be a lot more accurate than if I say the forecast for sales of, you know, this SKU or this item or this particular, maybe you run a, um, a retail shop, right? Or a grocery store sales of, you know, white bread versus wheat bread versus, 
mustard versus ketchup, or if you're looking at total gross sales, right, uh, of all items, you're going to be a lot more accurate because typically the records are better. Um, you've got financial history going back to the beginning of the company often, and those are usually going to have all of the sales data all combined. So you, you can be more accurate the broader you are in terms of all items sold or all electronics sold versus specific electronics if you want to drill down into various um, subgroups within your uh, retail store. And then uh, last assumption uh, that's common to all the forecast or a last thing to know is that um, the further out you try to forecast, the, um, the, the the more the accuracy decreases. If I'm trying to predict the weather three years from now versus three days from now, uh, the one three days from now is going to be a lot more accurate. And then three hours from now is going to be even more accurate than that. Um, things change because of those you know errors that occur. Um, random variations occur. It's harder to predict it uh, the further out you try to go. So if you're using forecasting, you know, most companies won't forecast out past a year on a lot of things. I and mean, maybe you look at the trend of the industry on an overall sales and you think, oh, stock should be going up if it continues at this rate or whatever. But things happen, right? Um, elements of a good forecast. If you're going to forecast something, it needs to be timely, accurate, reliable, expressed in meaningful units in writing, simple to understand, and cost effective. So why those things? Um, it's okay to, to give me a forecast of, of possible demand, but it's not okay to get it to me too late to make a decision on that. If, if the point at which I needed to order a resupply of products has already passed because of the um, you know the window that it takes to, to get it to me, then it wasn't timely enough to be useful. Um, we want an accuracy and a, a forecast is only as, as good as it is accurate. Um, reliable kind of falls into that same thing. Um, meaningful units. So, uh, you know, number of units we expect to sell, dollar amounts we expect. Um, meaningful units could be the weather, the temperature, right? Um, in writing, uh, that just is good business sense to have uh, a record keeping of it uh, so it's not forgotten or misinterpreted you can go back and reread it versus you know playing a game of telephone up the up the ladder the corporate ladder to uh, the CEO making a decision things get uh, miscommunicated um, simple to understand and use so a, a technique would not be uh, good if only one person in the company knows how to operate the the forecasting method because of the complexity of a spreadsheet that was designed and then if they leave the company now nobody can use this properly also if you make something that's so complicated that nobody can understand what the heck you're talking about then you haven't really um, uh, done your job there either and then cost effective if 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 you pay a lot of money to an outside company to forecast better and it costs you more money than the amount of sales you would have increased. Well, then that wasn't a good uh, good call either. So here we have the steps in the forecasting process. Step one, you want to determine why you're doing a forecast, right? Step two, establish uh, what that time horizon, the length of time out that you are forecasting to. It, it, am I going to forecast up to six months from now, up to 12 months from now, up to three weeks from now, whatever that is. Establish that length of time. Um, obtain, clean, and analyze appropriate data. You will, as you, you do at analytics, and if any of you are business analytics majors, you'll see this um, in practice um, throughout the, some of the, uh, the higher level classes, but you'll get huge amounts of data in a big spreadsheet. And cleaning data means that sometimes entries will be missing or there's clear evidence that there's a miss key. For instance, maybe you're looking at the temperature and it says it was 91 degrees, 92 degrees, 91 degrees, 93 degrees, 914 degrees. Probably somebody miskeyed that in. It was probably either 91 or 94 degrees that week, right? So you, you might have to go back and see if you can find that data or you might have to eliminate that row altogether. So cleaning the data, making sure that it is, is accurate and then analyze it where you you can run these techniques to try to do forecasting. You can try to interpret what the numbers mean and then, and then tell the story there, right? Um, step four, select which forecasting technique you're gonna use. 
And you might have several to choose from. And based on um, certain preliminary procedures, you might determine that one technique is more appropriate for the data, such as if you determine that there's a trend in the data, there's, there, there's one approach that is typically the most accurate. Um, and then make your forecast. And then after you've made that forecast, you monitor to see were there huge errors in my forecasting? And if so, I need to go back and maybe try one of the other techniques or apply the technique to the same data for the same period that already occurred and see how accurate that would have been and then make the change. There's two types of forecasting approaches. One is called qualitative and one is called quantitative. Uh, we are focusing more on the quantitative approach in this class. Uh, quantitative is uh, numbers you can do math to, right? Qualitative forecasting would be including soft information. This could be something like a hunch, personal opinions that you have. They're hard to uh, uh, quantify, maybe impossible to quantify. It, it could be that you just have a feel for the business. You know when the tides are turning, so to speak. Um, you, you, you just have, a, you've heard word of mouth. Hey, I think there's going to be something going on, um, you know, based on the buzz of customers or, you know, you hear buzz or, you know, um, uh, certain reviews on a movie, you can forecast that the movie is going to do well at the box office. Right. Um, but it's hard to quantify that. Right. So quantitative forecasting relies on the hard data, and it usually will either involve uh, you're, you're projecting uh, historical data or developing associated methods, something that you can say these are causal reasons why this would occur. Causal variables sometimes uh, with associated methods might be something like, well, if you have a three-bedroom house in this neighborhood, it's likely to sell more than a four bedroom house in this neighborhood because that's the type of neighborhood it is. With similar square footage, people would rather have larger bedrooms than more bedrooms that are smaller, right? So associative techniques where you can say a two car garage is gonna sell more than a one car garage, more than no garage, right? Simple things like that. Um, some of the qualitative forecasts you might make, uh, there's uh, four or so listed here. Um, one is executive opinions. You just get a group of upper level managers. They meet and they just develop the idea. Of, this is what we think based on our years of experience. You might uh, look at the opinions of your sales force, your, your frontline people because of what they've heard directly from customers. Um, consumer surveys, you send out mailers or email or phone calls, or you have something in the store to get um, a consumer opinion. Uh, unfortunately, the problem with consumer surveys is that often people will give surveys based on how they have felt about a past experience. And so they can be skewed heavily by service issues, uh, either positive or negative. And um, you know this gives you this gives you a subset of all your total customers, a sample of them to try to represent the entire population. Some other approaches might be the, um, the uh, getting opinions from all your other managers or staff or outside as experts, people that are in the field, um, professors, right? You might uh, get opinions from them uh, how to bring in a consultant that is a, a professor in, in that field, right? And the Del Delphi method is a, a way of uh, also doing that. You can read more about the Delphi method in your book, but it involves a, um, a series of um, uh, surveys to um, knowledgeable individuals coming up with a consensus. Time series forecast, this is projecting, uh, trying, to, trying to figure out patterns. Um, you look at uh, the idea that uh, there might be trend, upward trend or downward trend. Um, there, there, there are seasonality behaviors to, to include that uh, during the winter season, then retail stores are gonna do well because of uh, holidays that involve gifting. Uh, various cycles. Um, this could be through um, political turn and uh, um, and um, policies that have been enacted. Um, but the idea here with time series is that if I look at the past, I can predict the future. Here we have some of those behaviors, trends, seasonality, cycles, irregular variations. Um, this could be something like a layoffs or a strike. Random variation is just that, it's completely random. So trend, a long-term upward or downward movement. 
um, changing income population shifts could could uh, have that happen. Seasonality, um, lots of places experience uh, seasonal demand. It could be within the, within a single uh, day. Restaurants are busier during lunch and dinner time than they are at you know 10 a.m. or 3 p.m. Right? They're getting busier around noon or five to six for dinner. Right? Um, call centers will get busier after five when people get off work, or sometimes they're busier on a weekday than they are on a weekend because they assume they're closed. Movie theaters are busier during the, the um, primetime showing, so to speak. That's why they give discounts on matinee pricing before, say, four o'clock to try to encourage people to come to the earlier showtimes. Cycles would be um, economic, political, agricultural reasons, uh, you know, um, lasting more than a year. So there's a cycle of downward turn due to uh, maybe tariffs being put on uh, imported goods, right? Labor strikes, weather events, irregular variation, um, global pandemics we could throw in there as well. And then random is just anything you haven't accounted for that happens. All right, next we're going to look at types of time series forecasting, starting with the naive forecast. Naive forecast because you're just using the very previous value. You're not looking at any kind of trend, any kind of past except for the most recent one. Oh, we had 40 people show up uh, for, um, you know, this event last Saturday. Well, then let's assume we're going to have 40 again. We're not changing it at all. Oh, we end up having 45 this Saturday. Well, we're assuming that we're going to have 45 people next Saturday. Oh, we had 25. Well, we're going to assume we have, we're going to have 25 again next Saturday. We just keep on assuming the previous and we don't make any adjustments whatsoever. And so, um, you know, it's the simplest technique. There is a place for that, um, but maybe not the best technique. Maybe we can get more accurate. I think that with all the problems that you're going to solve in this book, uh, I don't, uh, spoiler, I don't think any of them are most accurate with the naive forecast. Um, but if you have a very stable time series, there's not much uh, change or the trend is very stable. You are going up steadily by, you know, five users a day on your website or something like that, right? Or if if you can look at seasonal variations, you can see when it's stepping down, when it's going back up and just, it, there's not huge changes in the, in the variation. It, it's not the worst, right? The worst would be just blind guessing. It's something to go on. Now we have uh, uh, some types of averages. The next three are variations on averaging. So this one is just a simple moving average. Um, you can see moving average, weighted moving average, and exponential smoothing are the types of averaging. But it helps to smooth out those variations so that if there are, um, uh, uh, you know, one huge change it smooths it out where you're not overcorrecting. Um, so moving average is if you just look at maybe the last three months or five months or so, whatever decided, it could be three, it could be four, it could be five, it could be two periods, whatever it is, you decide and you you uh, look at which one has been the most accurate by running it through uh, uh, op various options. But you just average out those, you just add them together and divide by the, the count. So if, it, if it's the last three periods, you add the value of the last three periods together and then divide by three. That's a simple moving average. Um, if uh, the more data points you use, the less responsive you're going to be able to be to uh, big changes because you might have smoothed it out too much. Um, the fewer you use, the more responsive you are to big changes, but maybe you end up overcorrecting because there was one random day where maybe there was bad weather and a lot of people showed up to a movie because their plans got canceled uh, for some outdoor uh, activity that they were going to do. And now you're overcorrecting for that one weather event, right? So uh, every, you know, every fourth period, you're using the, the, the previous three and then you're dropping the furthest, old, the oldest one as you go along. Simple moving average. Now, weighted moving average, the difference there is that you are looking at um, uh, the idea of the most recent period you're giving the most credence to, the most weight to, and then and then previous periods to that, you're giving less of, uh, you're, you're caring less about that. You're, you're still 
factoring it in, but you're not factoring it in as heavily as the most recent period. So maybe I give, I take, um, and, and we'll see this in the lecture that is on the quantitative work this week uh, that we're going to do in Excel and do it by hand. Um, we'll, we'll see what this actually looks like. But the general idea is maybe I might say the most recent period, I'm going to give 50% um, weight to that. And then the one before that, I'm going to give 30% and then I'm going to give 20%. Or maybe I do 60, 30, 10 or whatever. But those weights all have to add up to one or 100%. If you look at it as a percentage or you look at it as a decimal place, it adds up to one, all the weights do. Again, or adds up to 100%. Those are the same thing. Uh, make that clear. Um, yeah. And so you have just given a little bit more, um, you know, more care to the most recent period. The exponential smoothing is an average based on how far off you were. Basically, it's similar to the naive forecast, but you look at the error. And then you say, I'm going to give a 30% of the error. I'm going to adjust that way. So instead of saying, um, you know, I projected 40 and there actually were 45. So I was off by an error of five. Well, I'm going to project 45 next time. Well, no, we're going to do a percentage of that five. So we projected 40 last time. And we're going to give maybe, um, you know, a 40% correction to that error. 40% of five is two. So instead of projecting 40 again, now I'm going to project 42. It was 45. I was off by five, but I'm going to, I'm going to go up by two next time. I'm going to adjust it just a little bit. I'm going to smooth it out. I'm not going to overcorrect. I'm, I, I, I'm not going to make the assumption that one big variance means that I should, I should toss the entire uh, projection. Um, I felt good about my initial projection. So let's smooth that out a little bit. And that can be a good one as well. It, it's it's going to be more helpful for various industries and various businesses. Uh, linear trend uses a regression formula, uh, linear trend equation. Um, this is a little bit more mathy, but it's very good when you have uh, revealed the existence of a trend line. Meaning if you were to plot the, um, the period and the quantity, on an X, Y coordinates on a graph and you see dot, 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 dot going up or dot, 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 dot going down, um, trying to match the mirrored image. So I think from your point of view, up and then down is probably the right direction. Um, if, you, if you notice that, then you say, oh, there's definitely some sort of trend or there certainly appears to be some sort of trend. So we're gonna use the trend equation in order to, um, to basically determine a baseline which was at the time of zero. And then every period after that, we're either gonna increase or decrease by the amount of the slope. So period one, we're gonna decrease that baseline. We're gonna see a negative trend or every period we're gonna increase it and we're gonna see a positive trend. So we'll get into more on that on the practice problems, but that's the idea there. Uh, seasonality, maybe we are in a business where we know that um, certain months or certain days of the week are uh, higher or lower demand. And we've noticed this over the past several years of doing business or months of doing business. And so we can apply a seasonality to it. So I'm not going to get into this in too much detail. Uh, I'm not going to go through every bullet point here, but the idea is we can take our forecast method and then uh, apply a seasonality where we give it, you know, maybe plus two during March or um, we multiply it. So it can be the additive where we add or subtract this amount um, during certain days of the week. You know, if every Monday we have an average of five less customers or five fewer customers, we can just take five off of our daily forecast, right? Um, or we can multiply by say 1.1 or 0.9 to reduce a certain percentage off of each of them. Multiply by 2.3 every, every February. Um, or, you know, maybe, or March, right? Spring break, uh, and there's a lot more visitors in, in March to Cabo or whatever, right? Um, so we take, uh, we take those percentages, we multiply them for relatives to the forecasting method. And then you can also work backwards. You can de-seasonalize data by dividing by the, that number instead of multiplying by. Um, Associative forecasting techniques, this would be some sort of predictor variable. So I talked earlier about home values related to the um, 
property size, where it's located. If it's in this zip code, we can likely assume that the price is gonna be higher, number of bedrooms, number of bathrooms. So some sort of association between this value and this uh, value. All right, now let's talk about accuracy and controlling our forecast, making sure that we have, um, we're doing our part to ensure that we are checking and uh, getting the right forecast method in place. So um, an error is just your actual value minus your forecast. So once the period is passed, you can look at your forecast and subtract that from the actual value and see how far off you were. The error could be a negative number or it could be a positive number. And when we monitor it, we, we typically take the value and we turn it into the absolute value, meaning if it is a negative, we just convert it to a positive. So while this is the formula, you're really looking at the difference between the two. If the actual was 40 and your forecast was 45, well, then you're at negative five, right? 40 minus 45 is a negative five. But what we're more interested in is the difference. And the difference is five. And that's all that really matters for forecasting. We were off by five. And so there's methods of just reversing that or squaring it to remove a negative. Um, and we have to determine what amount of error is acceptable and what amount of error would be detrimental to our business. And so when we do that, we uh, monitor to see if those errors fall out of the acceptable range and then correct them uh, if necessary. There's three metrics that we, um, that we judge on and um, they have these acronyms, MAD, MSE, and MAPE. Uh, MAD is the mean absolute deviation, the average uh, difference of the absolute value would be another way of saying that. Um, but the idea that we just add up all of the differences of all of the uh, periods within a certain um, amount of time, maybe the first six months of the year, we add up all the differences. So we don't care about the negative number, positive number. We, we, we treat them all like they're positives, right? Add them all up. And then if it was six periods, we would divide by six. You just get the average of the errors. Um, MSE, the mean squared errors or mean square of errors, um, we square all the errors, which would remove the negative, and then we divide by, if there were six periods, we would divide by five, n minus one. n is always the number of uh, occurrences or observations, that lowercase m looking like that. And so we divide by not six, but five with MSE. It's a little bit different. You can see the other two are averages. This one is not an average. You're gonna divide by uh, N minus one instead. And this moves out the uh, some huge variations a little bit better than doing um, the absolute uh, average. And then MAPE, uh, mean absolute percentage of error or percentage error. The idea here is that um, let's say you're off on your projection by a thousand. Were you off by a lot? Maybe because every number is only uh, only matters to its relative uh, values, right? If I projected a thousand and it was actually two thousand, I was off by a lot. But if I projected eight point two five billion and I was off by a thousand, I was not off by much, right? So being off by uh, an error of a thousand doesn't necessarily mean anything until I see what I'm working with. And so this can be a really good, helpful uh, way of determining how accurate you actually were because it relativizes those errors to the values you're working with. And we can see I was off by 1% or I was off by 100%, right? A thousand could mean a lot of different things. So you just look at the, um, find, you find the error and then you divide by the, um, the actual value and you do that for every period. So if I was off by three and, I, and the actual was 100, well, I was off by 3%, right? And then once you get 3%, you add that to the next er error percentage, error percentage, and you average out those error percentages to see how far off you were on average over the course of, say, six periods, 12 periods or whatever. So here's a little grid, and, and when we do the practice problems this week, when you watch that video, you'll see how we fill this out. But the idea here, I'm just going to do one period for this video, and then we'll leave the rest of it for the actual work. The idea here is that um, in period one, the actual was 107, but I forecasted 110. How far off was I? I was off by three. So I do actual minus forecast to get negative three. Now, this up and down 
uh, let me put my highlighter on this, or sorry, my uh, laser pointer. This up and down symbol here means absolute value of the error. So the absolute value is just a positive number version of the number. So if it's a negative number, you turn it to a positive. If it's a positive number, you leave it alone, okay? You are off by three. Take the error back to here and then square it. Negative three times negative three is nine. You can see that if you square a negative number, it turns into a positive. If you square a positive number, it stays positive. And then how far off was I as a percentage? And again, when you're doing this times 100, if you're doing the work in Excel, ignore that. All this is telling you is how to turn 0 0.028 into 2.8%. And so doing it in Excel, you just click the percentage button to turn it into a percentage. Um, but doing it by hand, yeah, you could multiply by 100. All you're doing is shifting the decimal place. So this isn't really part of the formula, it's just a way to see that. Uh, but how far off was I? The error was three. So you just take the error, uh, divide by your actual, so three divided by 107 and you get 2.8%. Four divided by 125, you get 3.2%. And then here at the bottom, we take all of the errors, we, we add them together and the end was five, there's five periods. So 13 divided by five, the MAD would be 2.6. And then the MAPE, we added together, you get 11.23%, divide by five, you get 2.25%. But then MSE, the N, the number of observations is five, it's five periods. You divide the, the total by N minus one with MAPE, with MSE. It's a little bit different. You can't just do an equals average formula when you do MSE. All right, why, why, why would you choose one forecasting technique over the other? You got to figure out, well, does one cost more to hire somebody to do it? Is it accurate? Um, how available is that, that, that data? Do I actually have access to it? Is there um, cheap and easy to use software or rather economical use of software I could use to help me determine it? How long is it gonna take me to gather and analyze all that data? Can I get that done in time? And then also, um, the forecasting horizon, depending on how far out you're, you're wanting to be, some techniques are, are more appropriate. All right, finally, um, the better your forecasts are, the more you'll be able to take advantage of future opportunities and reduce risks, right? So uh, you're taking a big, you're, you're, you're often having to invest large amounts of money and time into decisions. And if you can, um, if you can forecast more accurately, then less risk will, will have to be taken. You're still risking everything. Just because you've made a good forecast doesn't mean it's gonna be an accurate forecast because decisions aren't um, results oriented. Des decisions are, did you make the best decision based on the availability of the data and the information you had at the time? If you ran through all of your other forecasting techniques and none of them got more accurate than the one you used, you still made the right decision uh, the best decision you could have made, right? It doesn't guarantee results though. Um, and then share sharing your forecast or demand throughout the supply chain will help improve the quality of your forecast because if they can make adjustments sooner um, and more accurately, then it helps everyone within the supply chain. So that's uh, your lecture for chapter three. Thank you everyone. I'll see you in the practice problem.